Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. It is currently raining and overcast outside right now, but it's supposed to be sunny and 76 by the end of the day. Yeah, that's bizarre. It is kind of bizarre. I, yeah, it doesn't really look like there's a break in the rain for a little while, which is wonderful. We've planted so many things outside, things that we haven't had a chance to run drip to yet. So my watering chores and Bethany water, <laughs> Bethany's watering chores today will be a lot lighter. Greatly reduced. Yes. Yeah. I did also want to mention before we jumped into the videos from this last week that the kneeling pads we did the pre-order on, they arrived yesterday. Finally, it seemed like it took forever. And I know we said they'd be here, excuse me, sometime in April, which... There's like a week left of April, right? Yeah. So they did arrive within April, but it seemed like it was such a great span of space between. I think we were hoping that they would arrive like early April, yeah. but you know, shipping is just. You never really know and it's out of your control a yeah. little bit. Mm -hmm. So anyway, they've arrived. The Ken and the warehouse crew are working super hard to get them all shipped out. Uh, they were all there till really late last night and then got there very early this morning to start in on that. I posted a little like 15 second clip on Instagram and Facebook of what it looks like in our warehouse because we haven't ever showed that. Yeah. Um, and it's evolving quickly. We've got a really great team, Ken's assembled down there. Um, and we're really happy with how it's going. So thank you guys, all of you who ordered kneeling pads. I hope you enjoy them when you get them. Um, I've sure been enjoying mine. We have more coming. Uh, I don't know when. <laughs> We're not going to do a pre-order on those. Probably I will let not. you know when they are back in stock. We'll, we'll just wait till they're here and then yeah. we can just ship them out immediately yeah. and that'll be less stress on hopefully be. everyone. Yeah. First video was container refresh for our kitchen patio pots. So the little patio right outside our kitchen entrance, we had to move everything out from away from the house while it was being painted and everything was still just sitting right there like kind of in a pile and there were, you know, pots with dead hydrangeas. A pot with a dead dogwood. Did those hydrangeas actually die? Uh, there was one bud on one of them, but huh. they're just not worth it to me. What, I mean, was they're it the beautiful. container, you think? The fact that they were in a container or they did not get enough moisture I over the we, winter? I think we dealt with a lot of lack of moisture on a lot of things this last winter. Um, and that could have been it. Could have been a sustain. But you know, when I did the little cleanup on them, they were fully alive mm -hmm. still. So it could have just hmm. been a random cold yeah, you know, cold thing snap. that got them. Uh, so you just never know for sure. Well, they say to put things like in containers, two zones lower. Yeah. So. And macrophylla hydrangeas for us, it's kind of an annual sort of situation most of the time. So, I mean, one could try to rebound them, but it's not worth it yeah. for me to try to do that. In fact, usually Bethany will try to rebound anything that I don't want to rebound. And she was like, nope, I'm going to mess with macrophylla. It's an uphill battle. Yeah. On those. But they were so gorgeous and we enjoyed them so much last year. Uh, okay, so we did, yeah, we potted up all of those containers. I ended up uh, planting some clematis too at the parking entrance. They're Guernsey cream and they're so pretty. Um, May Swafford said, love that space. How long will you keep the maple trees in the pots? Probably for a couple of seasons at least. The Japanese maples for us don't grow like the tags say that they do. They're more of like an ornamental small tree or large shrub for us because our conditions are a little bit too harsh. They don't like our high pH. They cannot take our full sun, even though the tags say full sun. Um, so we have to usually put them as an understory tree or somewhere where they're gonna be protected from afternoon sun. Pots oftentimes are a really good option for them. Uh, yeah, so we'll get some time out of them. Gardening with Caitlin said, hey Laura, love your videos, thank you. I've been following along for years, thank you for that. Can you tell me more about the beautiful trellis at the 229 timestamp? I love how it spirals around. Where and when did I get that? Was that a gardener supply? No. Wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I thought we did. That was in one of those like 10 gifts for gardeners. I like thought in... that, that that was the one that had like the more strap metal around it that had oh, the gold maybe. on the inside. Yeah, it definitely right. isn't. I mean, it's possible I could have gotten that from Gardner. It was either from Gardner Supply or from my parents' garden center. But it's I've had it for so long that I can't even remember. So... I wish I could give you more information, but it is a really sweet tre um, trellis. You kind of just accumulate things over the years. You do. It's, I mean, it's tough to remember where everything came from. It's kind of like how we do with our homes. You know, you accumulate stuff over time. I wonder if some people, though, are way more um, like sentimental about some of their things and they remember the story of Your where they got like everything. That. Your mom has such a good memory. Uh -huh. And she remembers things like that. I always like listening to stories when she tells stories about like you guys when you were little... Oh, I can't even remember. Like, when did Benjamin cut his first tooth? Do you yeah. remember? I have no idea. Right. You know, I just don't hold those kinds of details in well, my brain. 
with uh, with items like that, you and I are oftentimes pretty flippant about like when we don't have a use for something, we just kind of give it to yeah. someone who we think would have a use for yeah. it. And I don't feel like we're like, a, like have a hoarder mentality or anything like that. We're just kind of like. We were talking the other day, we could have some pretty awesome yard sales. If we yeah. were the type to like collect things over the yeah. year and then price them and do a yard sale instead, we just give stuff away when we, because we just don't want to deal with it. We don't want it around. We don't want it taking up space and like just being a junk pile yeah. um, somewhere, but we could have a pretty nice yard sale right. if we wanted to, yeah. <laughs> but that's kind of my nightmare <laughs> a little bit. Pricing <laughs> things and organizing. Ah, Terry said a little late now, but could you have moved those pots into the greenhouse in the winter? Yes, we could have, but the problem with like the, the hydrangeas, moving them in for the winter, they need a dormant period as well to be productive. And they would not have gotten that in the greenhouse because it stays too warm in there now. And we don't really have, uh, maybe if we would have put ends on that high tunnel yeah. out there and it was like cold storage, but it was protected, you know, from wind, protected from any kind of like real cold temps because it usually stays warmer. And then watered on a On a very regular a basis. Schedule. And like watered well, yeah. um, not just a little bit. I think we would have maybe made it through with them, but we just don't have anything like that set up. And maybe in this next year we could plan to put the and the, yeah, you want to move here. the high tunnels out. I just want to be careful about where we put them and have proper hedging and stuff in place because I don't know. I'm just so sensitive about people's views because I would always hope people would be sensitive about my views, you know? Yeah. I don't know. So we'll make sure that... Um, well, I think uh, here pretty soon, once Chad has some time to get the berm <laughs> going, I mean, we're going to be going to town. So I think all the neighbors are going to see, like, we're we're doing our part to try to put trees in place. Yeah. And they can too. Um, but you know what I mean? It's like we're trying to create that hedge, yeah. even if it's not there today. Like, it will be in a couple of years. Yeah. I just want to make sure that our neighbors continue to like us. Yeah. But that's... <laughs> that's really important to me. Yeah. So, it's legitimate. Uh, Amy said, I love the Japanese maple in the pot. I live in zone 8A and my home has a small front yard. Could I put a Japanese maple in a pot with no morning shade and afternoon sun? You're in an 8A, so much more mild climate. Yeah, you probably could do that. Kind of, I guess it depends. Are you like an 8A Arizona? <laughs> you know, like, I don't know what zones Arizona is, but are you like really dry heat or are you humid heat? Sure. That's a good question for your local garden center, actually. If you've got a really good garden center um, where you could ask that question, because it, it is a little bit like, you know, I don't know if people would hear, oh, you're a zone six. Yeah, you could put a Japanese maple out in a pot in full sun. Not here. Right. You just fry. Um, yeah, I would ask somebody that's local to you before taking my advice on that one, since we don't live in a zone 8A. And I don't know where your zone 8A um, is exactly. Uh, Katie said, Laura, when do you typically turn your irrigation on? It depends from year to year. We barely have just got ours all up and running. Yeah, it like was. Like towards the um, end of April. You know what? Last year, though, I was looking at photos. Mm -hmm. Our garden was like a month behind uh, where it is today. Uh, last year. Oh, really? Yeah. Like um, I found some photos that I posted on Facebook of you and I walking around and like the daffodils were just barely going at this point. And mm -hmm. the tulips weren't, weren't even a thing. So um, at... Like last year, I probably didn't turn on the irrigation till like sometime in May. And this year we did it a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing is all our reservoirs are like full. Like, well, flooding full. Yeah. Like too much water. Like they don't know where to put. We need to. We need more reservoirs. People need to build more reservoirs and yeah. not like let runoff happen. Don't let it go back into the ocean. Well, yeah. Arrgh. It's it's a total debate because the environmentalists don't want it because of the fish and wildlife. And, you know, they say that there's negatives to reservoirs. Which is why reservoirs haven't been being built. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So Kendra said, I've never seen hostas potted. Do you put them in a greenhouse over the winter? We do not. And hostas, at least the ones that I'm really familiar with, uh, like all of the proven winners ones, I think, are a zone three through eight. So when you're gardening in, gardening in a zone six and they're rated three zones lower than your, your growing zone, they are tough enough to handle being in a pot. The biggest thing that will kill your plants is not getting enough moisture. Um, and I'm noticing that on like some of our boxwoods in front of our greenhouse and stuff, it's the like the wind side. If they don't get enough moisture in their roots, they can't sustain enough moisture in their leaves through the winter and they'll get like wind, uh, wind burn on one side because there's not enough moisture in their leaves to handle that. Um, so I think that's the key is keeping on a very regimented watering schedule kind of no matter what kind of moisture you're getting because you're not exactly sure how much is making it in the pot and don't just water from one side water all the way around the root ball so that that whole root ball maintains moisture on all sides 
I think that's very important. I was informed like a year or two ago that there are Hasta clubs and collectors. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. There are like hundreds of varieties of Hastas. Lots and lots. Yeah. It would be interesting to go to a collector's garden. Well, that one gal in Rhode Island, mm-hmm. um, she had a ton of hostas. I don't think she was like a collector, but do mm-hmm. you remember her like kind of front yard? The one with the big, big beech trees? Yeah. 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 She in had Newport. a ton of different type of hostas. Yeah. Yeah, she did. I love her like orangery yeah. and the formal gardens around it. <sighs> okay. Next video is tulip update and planting a Japanese maple and clematis. So I think I just started out at the cut flower garden, right? And I just wanted to give you a, a, an update on how the tulips were looking out there. And then we planted the Tamukeyama, 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 Japanese maple up by our front porch. And I planted the clematis in that little trellis that we moved from the pot by the back kitchen entrance. I moved it into a flower bed and decided it would be a really pretty area to have a clematis. Emma said, I'm obsessed with clematis, but live in a small remote town and don't have access to a garden center. Have you started clematis from a seed or have any other recommendations of how to get my hands on one? I have not started clematis from seed. I do have some seed though in my possession. I just haven't tried starting it uh, from seed, but there are, if you live in a remote area, there are a few websites you can order plants from and have them delivered to you, Proven Winners being one of them. They really recommend you shopping at your local garden center. That's like their number one, but they also realize that there are some of you, like you, who live in a remote place where there just isn't access to those types of things. Um, so they offer plants online. Prices are of course higher because plant handling- It's like handling, full retail price. Yeah. Because they're not. Tr- they're trying not to undercut garden centers. Right, because garden centers are their like main focus. But anyway, um, yeah, plant handling is kind of difficult. <laughs> difficult. I'm so yeah. glad we don't do that. Um, and like my parents, every time we do like a house plant tour there or a, a nursery tour, which we should do one here soon because it's full and beautiful. But there are a lot of questions that come in. Can you ship this or that, you know, plant? And they're like, no, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we're not set up to do that. And oh man, I can't even imagine like fluctuations in temperature. What if it gets stuck somewhere and, you know, stays too hot and dries out? Oh. Britt said, have you noticed thrips in your double dafts or tulips? No. I'm having that problem terrible this year. I would like to cut them to share with family and friends, but don't want to send away flowers filled with bugs. I was so in your position last year. In fact, last year and the tail end of the year before, I just started noticing them. And maybe I had them to begin with, but they were just so light and I didn't have very many of them. And then we decided to try the whole dahlia wintering them over underground experiment in which case i think i overwintered a ton of thrips because we you know we piled up leaves and grass clippings and straw like this real fluffy warm comfortable bed for these bugs to overwinter in and it was the worst thrip year ever the year after so we tried biological controls which is what we're going to do again this year we had some predatory mites released in our garden um, and i believe i can uh, see if i could find the websites like k-o-p-p-e-r-t Copert. Copo. Oh yeah. That's the company that the biologicals came from, but I'm working with somebody through Ag Idaho to get this all done. And then there's a drone company that works with them as, as well. And they, they came out and did the whole release over the property. You can do it by hand though as well. I think we linked everything in that video or oh, tried to we? link everything. Yeah, I'm so sure we did. Go back to that video if you want to like names yeah. or things like that. And more in-depth explanation of the type of mites. I even showed some paperwork that they gave me with all the different kinds of beneficials and what kind of um, insect pests they will target. Uh, so anyway, I've heard from them. We're going to be working on that here pretty quick and they've got some new stuff that they want to try out too. There's some slow release beneficial packets and things that you can hang on your plants. And I just have been so encouraged by that. I mean, we took a year off from giving any of our flowers away, but we've already been able to give away lots of, um, spring flowers, which has been so fun, um, because I'm not noticing any problems and we probably won't start in on the biological treatment until it gets warm enough, probably next month at some point. But if we can get on it early enough in the season, the problem is, is that you kind of have to have something for them to eat for them to stay. Yeah. So if you release all these mites, but you have no thrips in your garden yet or anything for that, that's kind of like releasing ladybugs. If you release them, it's no good unless they have something to feed on. They'll go somewhere else and look for food. Um, So you almost need to see a little bit of evidence and then get on it early enough to to take care of it. But it allows you to not spray. We didn't spray a single thing except for BT um, on... Super tunias, super bells, and then on my cabbage, I did a little bit to keep the green caterpillar 
like the cabbage moth. Am I just like imagining this, but did we hear that somebody was working on a, like a um, budworm resistant petunia? Yeah. Well, they've probably been working on it for... I'm sure somebody's been working yeah. on it yeah, for a while. Yeah, it's but. the budworm and the cabbage moth. So we spray for those things. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth it for us to plant petunias. Wouldn't that be great? Oh, yes. That would be amazing. Anyway, I was just encouraged because I just would love to... I mean, one, I'm not opposed to spraying when it needs to happen. But I think that it can be detrimental and I think it can be mishandled so much. And um, if we can get away from that, even if it causes you to kind of sacrifice what you want to do with your crops for a season or two in order to kind of balance an ecosystem to where you can go forward without having to spray, you also don't have to buy the chemical. You don't have to take the time. I mean, it's all, it takes equipment to do that. It takes your time. It takes buying the stuff to do it. And so if you can eliminate all of that, it's a win-win, I think. Win-win, win. Win-win, win. win. Mrs. D.M. King said, can you share what and how you plant over the tulips and try to decide what to plant once they die back? Out there in the cut flower garden, we will not keep the tulips out there. Those will all come out, and I've already decided which varieties I want to replant in our garden. Daffodils are usually the most worth it, and I'm only picking just very few of the tulips because tulips just don't naturalize. They're almost an annual in our area. Some varieties, though, like the mentons are coming back decently. We are noticing yesterday that they're starting to bloom and yeah. so they, it just seems like they're they're doing a pretty good job in other areas though like we used to plant bulbs underneath our maple trees and then we would plant annuals right over the top whenever you do that they just don't come back the, they don't come back that great regardless whether right. you plant over the top or not yeah um but i think it's even worse when you plant over the top because so you nick bulbs yeah. you might you know damage a few here it's or like there not a great thing to do if you're real concerned about the tulips if you know if you're okay with them going away you know go for mm-hmm. it yeah well like um there's a double tulip called rosy diamond out there oh it's so pretty Doubles usually do not come back very, very well at all, but I'm willing to give that one a shot. So once those, you know, once we're ready, I'll pull those and go plant them out in the garden. Um, Daffodils, though, many of the daffodils I'll probably save and get those planted out. And most of them, there's a few blooms left, but most of those are bloomed out. Judy said, what do you fertilize your crabapple tree with or do you, do you do anything special to it? We typically don't after they receive, or after they receive, after they reach a certain age usually the first year that you know we give them biotone when we plant um, we top dress all of our beds with compost so everything's getting a little dose of some you know nutrients in that and it does work its way down into the soil um i want to say do we we do like tree tone for maybe mm-hmm. the first year or two or three or three possibly yeah. but once trees get past that point we just kind of stop fertilizing yeah, well, just the compost, really. Yeah. I mean, they'll get a little bit of resi- residual from the plant because you plant things pretty close. So, yeah. like, they'll get some nitrogen from the flowers around mm-hmm. there, the perennials, whatever you've got. Right. Love Soil 8512 said, why a tree there when you were thinking of opening the area with a French door? Oh, because that's going to be, that may not ever happen. And it would if it does, it's going to be way out in the future. I don't know if that'll ever happen. Right there. Yeah, I I don't know either. So we just kind of at some point, you just have to like not leave it empty. We've got a priority know? list, and it's just like down the road. Like because a barn for horses is yeah. higher than renov- right. house renovation for me anyway. <laughs> I don't know, but I think you're kind of in the same. I think I am too. Realm. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if I always was, but I'm definitely, you know. You've grabbed that project. And like taking the reins more than I ever thought you would. Really? Actually, remember I asked you the other day, I'm like, are you excited about horses? Because it's not ever been like something really high on your list, but you were yeah. talking about how you are excited. and. Well, I'm excited because you're excited. Yeah. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah. And I think it would look, I mean, it, you know, it's cool. It'd be cool to have horses, especially with, you know, some nice paddocks and a nice barn and stuff. The That'd kids be... will love it. No. Yeah. You get your bobcat, I get the horses. Yeah, right. <laughs> In the long run, I think my project's going to cost a lot more, most yeah, likely. Yeah, the barn will be, uh, will be a lot. Yeah. Colson said, have you ever dealt with tulip fire in your tulip beds? Tulip fire. I've never even heard of that. Uh, hold on. i got to look that up. It's a fungal disease caused by Botrytis tulipae, which produces brown spots 
and twisted, withered, and distorted leaves. It's so named because in severe cases, plants appear as if scorched by fire. I have been, I've never even heard of that, so no, wow. I haven't dealt with that before. There are some articles about how to prevent and treat Botrytis tulip fungus, dutchgrown.com and gardensillustrated.com. Boy, I hope I never have to research that. <laughs> any further. Next video was planting pink perennials. And that was a fairly short video, like shorter than most. Did we do that on the weekend or? I think we did. Oh. And it was really um, windy that morning. So oh. we kind of like, we had bigger plans for the day, but we ended up only being able to get out later in the afternoon. So it was still really a, a great, I was excited, a great little spot we got filled up. So we planted the um, prismatic pink flocks and then the new yarrow called something fuchsia, firefly fuchsia. Yeah. I think. Yeah. And I ended up putting them together in the same bed and they look so pretty together. Um, the flocks are looking a little weary because we had so much wind. Mm -hmm. Well, that morning it died down enough for us to plant them. I didn't know it was supposed to continue being windy, but it was windy for a couple of days, like windy, windy. Um, <clears throat> so they're looking a little like I need to cut them back and let them flush back fresh. Betty said, I never knew much about yarrow. It is so pretty. Does it stay in bloom all summer? For much of the summer. They start usually a little later than now. Like my yarrow that I've got planted right now is just leaves. You know, they haven't shot up any bloom stalks. It's usually midsummer, And then they bloom through the whole rest of the year. They look pretty even if you leave them up all winter long. They hold snow really well. And, and they're wonderful to use in dried flower arrangements as well. Amy said, just wondering if you guys have moved the espalier pear yet. <laughs> we didn't move it. We just haven't planted it yet. <laughs> we need to do that. Yeah. I was noticing one of the bottom arms is dead. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, it's not all the way dead. The first spur has growth, but all the rest of it's dead. I wonder when that, when it died. I don't know. I think when we moved it, it was too early maybe, or it hadn't leafed out quite, quite yet. So you wouldn't have known. So I didn't really notice or I didn't, you know. Yeah. So I was looking at that growth spur thinking, I wonder if I can pull one of those branches down and train it. But that would be the beauty of getting it planted and getting some guide wires, some mm -hmm. training wires up. So I can start pulling stuff over and, yeah. and staking it. That type of a project is, is like, um, <clears throat> this is a tough time of year because everybody's working on a lot of different things. There's a ton of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And we kind of have to have me and you and Paul probably all day. Mm -hmm. Because things will happen. We'll have to, you know... It'll be a big project. And right now, Paul's working on jackhammering those concrete, the bottoms of those um, basketball hoop holes yeah. out. It's like three feet of concrete. There's a lot of concrete. Underneath him. And they were trying to get it out yesterday. They uh, rented a concrete cutter and cut around it. And then they were trying to lift it out with the tractor. There was no, like, it wouldn't yeah. come out. So they had to go get a jackhammer. So that's what Paul's working on currently. But the new hoops are here, um, and the big basketball backboards are down. So we will have no hoops. <sighs> I've got a concrete guy coming who's going to help us set the... The new poles? Yeah, not the new poles. It's just like the base for them. They oh, have lag sure. bolts that stick up, and then you put the pole on top of that. But I kind of wanted like a professional to do the concrete portion because I don't want to like mix it wrong or I don't know. Well, I just want... those things are too heavy. Like the, the tops are too heavy. You can't really mess around with it the being The new hoops improper. are... are pretty beastly mm -hmm. so in the end i don't know when this is all going to happen it could even take a couple of years but in the end we're going to resurface the whole court um maybe like a forest green with white uh lines for basketball and the new hoops go down to like five feet so the kids can play and then i think we're going to do pickleball <laughs> pickleball lines i never as even well. played pickleball but i bought a pickleball set because yeah. everybody like your side of the family i think most everyone yeah, has played and they ball. love it my sister-in-law loves it my brother's wife maybe this fall or maybe next spring we'll do the fence the mm -hmm. um chain link fence mm -hmm. black powder coated and i think it'll look nice especially because by that time we'll have a lot more trees so like in the end i think the goal is to kind of like hide that whole area so you don't really you don't really see it you won't see it from the pond as those right. trees start to get bigger and mm -hmm. um, there'll be trees all the way around it and you won't you won't see the kid area like the kids play area either yeah right none of it It'll all be shrouded. Mimi said, where and what kind of handle do I get to go with the auger that I ordered from Garden Answer? You may have mentioned this in another YouTube video, but I can't find the info. Info, like the handle for the drill? Yeah, we have the drill on our website. I'll link it and we can put a picture on the screen. That's the one that we recommend. You can, there's other brands, you know. Does the handle come with the drill? I, it does. She's just asking for the handle. Yeah, it comes, but you know, you could check on Amazon and see if you can find a handle for whatever drill you have. But my guess is if it didn't come with one, it wasn't, in, you probably can't attach a handle 
to a drill that didn't come with one. Unless it's a DeWalt drill and you just need the, you, like you don't have the handle or you misplaced it. Yeah. It just a goes lot of them in are circle. Too sm- a lot of them are too small though. Like mm. it would go over where you like change the, the, the drill speed or yeah. whatever. Um, so I'm not sure that you can just do that with any, any drill. Mm. And most drills, I mean, unless you're buying a drill that is sort of powerful, like most home drills that people buy are really underpowered. And they don't need the handle. And you don't need the <laughs> really? handle. Yeah, because yeah. it doesn't have the power to, to know, crank your wrist it. anyway. Right. Cat caretaker said, does Samantha have a boo-boo over her eyebrow? Yes. She um, got herself in the face pretty good on the gate that leads to the fireplace area. And right after it happened, because... Aaron was sitting inside the fireplace area. I was walking behind her. And so we were in, in between her watching this whole thing go down. She, of course, like hysterical. Yeah. And she has her hands over her eyes. And so I just barely get a glimpse. And it looked like it dented in her forehead. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I could see like blood starting to come out. And I thought, oh, like all these things ran through my head. One, it's a head wound. It's going to bleed everywhere. Um, two, is it going to scar? Is she going to need stitches? Like right. all of these things. And uh, it barely bled. Like it. Yeah. Barely bled, but it left Lucky. a pretty gnarly looking. You can tell wound. when your kids get hurt, like you know when Samantha falls down or whatever. You can tell the type of cry. It's like okay, you're gonna be good in about thirty seconds. Yeah. Um, but this one, you could tell, like she got hurt. Yeah. Oh, that's unfortunate. It's the fir- one of the first things I want to show Nana. <laughs> so we we Facetime my parents, and of course they're like ah. But about 10 minutes later, Samantha's running down the driveway, just like doing this with her head and yeah. singing. And so I sent my mom a little video. I'm like, she's fine. Yeah. She's fine. It just looked scary. Mrs. Charlene said, can you do a video on how the farm operates? Do you have meetings with Paul and Bethany once a week or do they make their own schedules? How does the work get divided up? You all seem well organized and would love to know how it all works. We don't have any meetings. I don't think we've ever had a meeting. No. I mean, we chat with each other throughout the day in passing, yeah. you know, and we text a lot. Like, uh, Paul and Bethany will text me if they're getting ready to do something and just say, like, do you want me to film this or do you want to put this in a video or do you want me to just go ahead and do it? Um, There's a lot of communication that goes on during the day, just not face to face. Yeah. Uh, You know, sometimes we'll send a message if there's something that's priority, like, hey, we need to have this done like right now. We'll send a text and they'll, you know, abandon what they're working on and go go work on it. Or we'll just text and say, hey, could you add this to your list? You know, and that means not priority. Just add it to the bottom of your list whenever somebody gets to it. Great. Yeah, we end up taking a lot of photos of things in the evenings when we kind of do like garden yeah. strolls. We're just trying to do stuff with the kids and whatnot. And yeah. So we'll be walking around or you'll see something mm-hmm. that needs to be done and snap a photo. I try really hard like uh, when I do planting videos. When I've got a gator full of plants, every time I leave an area, I take a picture and I edit it. And I put a big red circle around what I just planted and I send it to Paul. And every new thing that's uh, added into the garden, he adds drip to. He's got his gator. We kind of have our own <laughs> our own gators. Yeah. And he's got his set up with all the drip supplies. And he has a really good knowledge of where it's all at. And he buries a lot of it now, which is kind of hard for us because then we're like, did he add drip to that? Right. Well, most likely. Like, he doesn't let things slip through the cracks, like, very often. Maybe once a year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, something, it just happens. Um, but, you know, sure enough, you get in there and there's drip all the way around the root ball, but he kind of buries it in because oftentimes if you don't, you know, you have to mulch a lot more often. So it, it behooves him to bury it deeper because then I don't see it. And I'm yeah. not like, oh, we need to re-mulch this area, right. <laughs> you know. Tara said, I love watching your videos daily. I have such a desire to grow my own plants from seeds, but I'm clueless on what is the best option for me. What are the differences between a greenhouse and a grow light? Can you help me? To grow your own plants from seeds, you really don't need a whole lot of equipment. You do not need a greenhouse. It's, it's handy <laughs> to have a greenhouse that has heat for sure. Uh, It's handy to have a cold frame even where you can, you know, start some of your cold season stuff or even move seedlings from inside into a cold area to grow on once they've put on some size. Um, You don't even necessarily need a grow light. However, I would say if you're going to get into the realm of starting seeds, buying a grow light or setting yourself up with, you don't have to have a fancy grow light. You can set yourself up with, uh, there's a lot of DIY versions of it you can do. I would definitely consider doing that because you'll have much stronger seedlings and it's far less discouraging when you have at least the grow light set up to create nice, strong seeds, seedlings. Uh, But some people still do the windowsill method, you know, where you've got all your seeds on a table on the south side of your house um, where they can receive a lot of sunshine that way and you have to rotate them every once in a while so they don't just lean toward the light. But yeah, I would say of all supplies to have a grow light would be the best 
I don't even think you even need heat mats. I rarely use them. Um, I've got them. I used them, was it last year? I started most of my seeds out there and I didn't even use this year. I started a lot of them in here and only had one wall of grow lights going for seeds. And as soon as those were sprouted and up, I moved them out to the greenhouse and then started a new batch in here where it's a little warmer. But last year I put a lot of them on heat mats just to get them up and going to create a little more heat in the soil. Um, and so I was able to not have to have them inside. All that said, I think grow light's a good investment, but a greenhouse is not necessary. Next video was delivering tulip bouquets, raised bed tour, and potato bed prep. So I had gone out and picked a few buckets full of tulips uh, the night prior, and I had them in our root cellar. Uh, waiting for my mom and I to get together in the morning. We put together just some simple bouquets and the kids helped us and we took them up to the assisted living facility. And then I came back home and showed you guys how the raised beds are doing. We have stuff up in every single one now, which is great. We were waiting on the celery and it's still really, really small, but it's looking good. And then we went out and prepped the potato bed. And that morning we'd gone out and bought a, a rototiller. So now we own a rototiller. Yeah. We had a little battery operated one and it got, it got passed around quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and eventually it kind of gave it up. It just stopped working. I don't know if the batteries just were bad. Um, I don't think it was just the batteries though, because Paul messed with it and usually he can get everything to work again. Yeah. And he was like, this, this is just toast. So anyway, we needed something a little bit bigger anyway. So this is a gas powered one and it did the job. It was like such a pleasure to plant potatoes. I did a little bit of research on electric tillers, and it was it's tough to find um, to find something like big enough mm -hmm. in the electric variety. I was hoping that like Dewalt would have one. Mm -hmm. They don't. Well, I noticed with that little one that we had, it bounced a lot. Like it wouldn't go in. Yeah, and you need dig something in. with a little bit of weight. Yeah, Na like natural weight, just to bring the tines down. Yeah, the other one would just like. Boom, 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 like on top of the soil. And yeah. I, could, you know, especially when I did the area in front of the chicken coop. Yeah. Boy, to have a nice tiller that day would have made my job a lot but easier. But that would have been too big, I think. I don't think so. Really? No. Well, look at how big the chicken coop flower bed is compared to the one row that I did out there. Isn't it big. like way smaller? No. Oh. Then it, the... And it's like odd shaped. Wouldn't you have a hard time maneuvering the big rototiller? No. Oh. I don't think well, so. What do I know? <laughs> and I think I could have done a larger area and then scaled it in how I wanted to. Yeah. But it, it would have been way easier than the mantis one that we had. First question's from Nancy. How do you, the strawberries in the greenhouse get pollinated? We have pollinators in there. There are bumblebees and honeybees and flies. There are wasps in there on occasion and they are pollinators as well. Um, the sides go up every, every day. day. Yeah. So there's lots of stuff. Yeah. The sides go up like this far. Yeah. We've got, I mean, you can see everything, the contents of the tables from the street beyond, you know, you can see what's in there. And so there's a lot of insect activity all the time. And said, maybe you mentioned this before, but where do you get the tea, the teepees, the uh, peas are on. I got those at my parents' garden center. They're like bamboo teepee trellises. They're like expandable. I don't know what brand they are but they have them down there. <laughs> Crispy said, uh, why didn't you walk behind the tiller rather than straddling the rows? Because it's sort of painful to watch. Well, yeah, but who wants to till up your row and then compact it by walking right behind it and putting a big feet prints in it? No, thank you. So I will straddle the row or walk beside it. That's why when I did the row next to it, I did the first one in the center and then I did the side ones next so that I could walk beside it. So it's all fluffy and nice looking instead of footprints through it. That's why. Oh. Mab Star Surge said, have you thought about experimenting with planting rice? Maybe try them in a sealed pot or container. I'd love to see that. I've actually not thought about experimenting with rice. Don't you have to have a tremendous amount of water for that? I don't know. Yeah, don't you? I mean, all the pictures I've seen of like rice fields, isn't it like... like grow in water. Yeah. Maybe uh -huh. I don't know. But I've never thought about it. <laughs> that would be kind of a neat experiment though. Marie said, are you aware that Aaron is in one of the photos in Wellsprings website? <laughs> we just looked, you looked through this morning yeah. and you mentioned that to me. Yeah. So it was back when we planted the planter last year, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So hopefully we can go back and do that again this year because they took really good care of it. It looked really great. Aruska Bell said, did they give you back your jars? They always ask me, do you want these back or what do you want us to do with this? And I'm hoping to set up a system where they just keep them there and we bring the buckets of flowers to them and they can either arrange their own flowers or I can arrange them there. And that way it's actually easier to transport flowers in big buckets rather than in individual vases. So we'll figure something out. And the last video from this week was the April 2024 garden tour, which was 
long. Yeah, really long. Yeah. There was a lot to see though. And we did not break it up into two videos like we normally do, which means that I didn't really spend a lot of time going through all the plants or walking through all the areas like I could have. But sometimes it's nice to see it all at once. I think. Donna said, non-garden question. There have been lots of houses built around you in the last few years. Do your neighbors mostly commute to Boise for work? My sense of Ontario is that it's a more of a rural farm community or is there industry in the area? We do have Orida. It's a big potato like processing plant. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of all of our neighbors. None of them commute to Boise. No. Thinking of everybody around us. I don't Some think of them are retired. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, like It's not that rural. Mm -hmm. It's not like... I think six I mean, of our neighbors are retired. Yeah. We do live in a rural area, but yeah. it's it's not... Um, our town is like 10, 11,000 people. But I want to say that all the towns within like a 20-mile radius, what would you say? Like maybe there's 30,000? Maybe. I have no idea. Um, and a lot of people shop in Ontario because there's no sales tax in Oregon. Uh -huh. So there are a lot of people that live in Idaho. Just I mean, like we can see the border from our house. Mm -hmm. Um they shop in Oregon and live in Idaho. Mm -hmm. Next question. Why don't you put the hidden pond in the circle area near the Hartley? Um, you know, I want something that is really visible, like visually pleasing from all sides in that area. So it needs to be probably a circular fountain of some kind, some something like that. I've got an idea of where I want the hidden pond, and I don't really feel like that aesthetic mixes well with what we've got going on in that area. It's very formal and very tidy and very, like, crisp in that area, and it's not, like, mountainy, natural sort of like you get with that pondless waterfall, which I love, but I feel like that belongs out in the South Garden, and we need something a little more formal in that space. April said, isn't your septic tank close to the, <laughs> to the smell? Now, I did not preview this video before it went out, and maybe I should have. Aaron left in all of that stuff. That was not meant to be left in the video. Yeah, there was a, a strange smell at one point. And it and, was. And yes, it was near where our septic is. We just had that pumped out like... Just a couple years ago. Yeah. Like, it could have been three or four, I guess. No, but... I don't think it was four years ago. I think it was just a couple of years ago. I think Samantha was a baby. Maybe. She's only three. Maybe. So two, three years ago, maybe? Yeah, not like not long enough. Because I know people that like they don't get their septic tank pumped out for like 20 years. It, it wasn't anything that lingered either. It was just like a random in passing smell. Yeah. And um, yeah, I haven't smelt it again since that day. I am a little bit worried. I mean, if, they're, if we keep smelling, then we'll have to have investigate. Yeah. But um, hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully it's fine and everything's fine and our septic is fine. Yeah, you've got good memory there, remembering it's right there. That Yeah, the, the tank is really close to our house, like really close. And then it's the yeah. septic field, like the drain field. Yeah. That's beyond it, where we were standing. Amy said, so instead of the black bench uh, placed along the formal walkway, maybe try a stone backless bench. We were just talking about that. We walked out this morning and I said, you know, Aaron, I don't know if I really want a backed bench here because I think it's beautiful and I like I like the look of the black bench coming up from the boxwoods, but I don't like that it blocks my view of the urn. Mm -hmm. like the whole point is to keep the area clear enough to where we can see those urns shine. So I think your idea of the backless bench, I was telling you, maybe just a few concrete benches that the boxwoods hide, you still have a place to sit, you know, if we're over here. We're going to be over there less though because the kids are spending so much more time over in the play area. And really they've got the whole basketball court to ride their stuff on and they were using that a lot because that was really the only place we had for a while because the brick patio took forever to be finished. Right. And um, so they just ride up and down that brick walkway, but now they have more options than just there. I like the backs of the benches. I like seeing them. Even blocking the urns. Yeah. I, I don't think it would be a bad thing to, because we need benches around the garden. So I actually had my mom look at it last night. They were over and I just asked her if she could order three more and maybe we could try it. They're so lightweight and easy to move that we can move them anywhere else in the garden and use them if we end up not liking them there. Yeah. Much easier than placing concrete benches and cheaper. Yeah. For sure. So it's worth a shot. Judy said, Laura, what is your deal with boxwoods? What's your deal, man? <laughs> I like them. I read it like that, but maybe that's not how she means it. That's the hard part with like text messaging sure. and comments. You never know the inflection, but I like boxwoods. And if I had it my way, I mean... I would have boxwoods everywhere. And not that this, like the South Garden isn't my way. I understand that there's limitations with having boxwoods everywhere. One, you'd have to have somebody just employed full time to be your boxwood hedger yeah. person and to maintain the boxwoods and to, you know, I don't know. You really have to have them in a more of a protected area. 
uh, they do better than they do like out in the full, full sun. As, as long as you don't trim them, they do great in the full sun, but you have to be very calculated about when you hedge. Otherwise they get tip burn really bad. But I just love boxwoods. I love how, like, for me, they bring peace. I know that they can look rigid, maybe just to, to some people, um, and they might seem a little bit too, like, fussy. Mm-hmm. I like that. <laughs> it brings me peace to see that in garden spaces. However, I do like to see a tight boxwood hedge backed by a big, beautiful cottage border. So I like a little bit of everything, but I do just love boxwoods. I think they're just so pretty. And depending on what variety you get, the glossy green... You know, I just, I love that. I feel like it brings, it cools areas down to me visually. Terry said, will you need more help to manage the additional flower beds? Uh, eventually, once we have like all the dirt lands cultivated and we like need to weed more and stay on top of stuff like that. Yeah, maybe. It's hard because it's only certain times of the year. Right. You know, it's like spring, we could use another full-time person out here and probably fall, fall cleanup we could use another full-time person. And if we took the Christmas lights off Paul's plate, he would just love you. He doesn't yeah. love putting up Christmas lights. It's it's tough favorite. too, uh, based on the person, because it's like, if you got another Paul, you'd be set. Oh but yeah. But there's other people that we've had out. It's like, well, you'd need 10 of them. Well, or they're just like, they're a detriment. They're not actually yeah. a help. They're a detriment. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> and so yeah. you have to be like, we are so lucky with the team. Like we don't want to upset the balance. Yeah. And I think sometimes you're willing to work extra and you're willing to work harder to not have an extra influence yeah. in because yeah, you're not having to deal with that. And I think that we like mindset is the same for everybody. We have such a good team and we all get along so well. Um, you just don't want to mess up the balance yeah. and adding an extra person and can sometimes do that. Sometimes not, but it took us a while to to land on this team too, sure, you know. Sure. Andy said, uh, wow, great video. Is this recorded on iPhone 15? The resolution uh, is amazing. Yeah, whatever the newest iPhone that's out, the Pro, honestly, it does look really good. Like, do you remember when we started making videos? No one filmed with a phone. It w- wasn't done. Mm-hmm. They didn't look good. Yeah, the barrier. The, is it the barrier to entry? Yeah, it's so low now. So, yeah. I mean, it, you still have to have a few hundred bucks to buy a phone, but that's nothing compared to what it used to be. Yeah, you didn't Like, have to it buy was nice hard cameras. to make YouTube videos when we started in 2014. Mm. I, there were phones, but people just weren't uploading. The quality was like there. Like, Instagram didn't exist at the time. Mm-hmm. At least I don't think so. Maybe it did. Uh, uh, it was. It existed early on. We just didn't not in the form that it is now. Yeah. Right. It was all the like sepia tone uh, filters, filters <laughs> yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. And everything was square. Right. And the last question for this week's recap is from Stacy. At 11 minutes, did Douglas spray your door? I sure hope not. I watched that portion of the video and I don't think he did um, because his back end went up just a little bit, but he was, um, Russell was sitting right there and I think mm-hmm. he was just asserting dominance. I've never, I so I see Douglas make the motion. Like, I know what the motion looks like when a cat is spraying. I see him make the motion, but I've never seen actually, like, anything come out. My parents' cat does the same thing. My parents' cat is a female, and she does that motion, but nothing ever comes out. Well, you can always see what, like, the thing that they were supposedly spraying on, and there's nothing... Yeah. There's nothing there either from Douglas. I saw Douglas doing that the other day, and I ran over, and I was, like, inspecting, and there was not a single drop anything um so yeah they make motion all day long as nothing as long as nothing comes out so gross anyway that is it for this week's recap video thank you guys so much for watching hope you're having a great start to your week and we will see you in the next video bye